and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. You can personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of Precision Hydration worth up to $9.99 using the code OxygenAddict. We're also brought to you by FoodCell.co.uk. The next generation of top tube nutritional carrier for your bike, designed to allow endurance triathletes and cyclists to carry enough food and gels while allowing easy access. You can use the code FREEPOST for free delivery worldwide. You can check it out at foodcell.co.uk. And finally this week, thriver.co. Take health tracking to a new level with your personalized at-home finger prick blood test. Improve your health today and catch any small health issues before they become big health issues. You can get 50% off your first baseline or advanced test with the code OxygenAddict. And welcome to the show. We made it, Hells. So that was take two, everybody. I fluffed the intro the first time. <laughs> it's probably about take 10, let's be honest. Oh, listeners, we have had fun today. We've had the recording software not starting. We've had Skype resetting itself. It's been a trial, hasn't it, Hells? A, a complete trial. And yeah, my computer <laughs> just will not find Wi-Fi. So here we are on my mobile phone. Oh, we're doing Amazing. the best we can, aren't we? <laughs> we're going to get there. It'll be fine. Oh, bless you. So how's your weekend been? You had a good one? Yes, brilliant, Rob. We were away in the land of no reception, i.e. deepest, darkest Herefordshire. Nice. And um, yeah, we, we rented a cottage with friends to celebrate Rich's 40th birthday. Very pleasant. Bit of exercise or was it mainly partying? A good mixture of both. So oh, good, good bit of exercise because the kind of group that we have um, as as friends probably can sit still for about... I'd suggest three seconds, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. And then you've got to yeah. get up and move. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, runs, bike. Others went on bike rides. We all did some walking. There was like a games room in this place. So rather competitive table tennis and air hockey. <laughs> it was amazing. Nice. <laughs> and then clearly lots of um, lots of food, plenty of cake um, and, yeah, a, a good amount of um, wine and a good amount of fizz. And Rob, we also got to try some uh, beer, which was very delicious. Only 3% alcohol. Genius craft beer. Very, very nice. Very tasty. So if you want a sort of, you know, low calorie beer, then um, craft, craft sort of beer, uh, quite a citrusy flavour, then oh. genius. was very, very tasty. There you go. Good stuff. I, uh, How's yours? I, I managed to swim in my Speedos in the sea in Mallorca Hells. How's that? I thought you, thought you were going to say that you swam in your Speedos, um, I don't know, up, let's say off the North Wales coast or something. <laughs> it didn't feel a lot warmer in the sea in Mallorca than it would do swimming in North Wales, let me tell you. I dived in and you know you get that instant sort of ice cream headache getting crushed by having your ice, head squeezed between two uh, two massive ice blocks. Yeah. Going, yeah, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Every time I tried to put my face in to do any kind of front crawl, it was just, <gasps> no, head's got to come up again. Oh, so, so how long did you stay in for? Oh, a minute. Um, uh, yeah. Hey, that's better than me. I, I don't know if I would have gone in for it even... Was... It was lovely and warm and it was dead refreshing. But you know when, you know, you need two swim hats on to stop your head having that feeling. And I didn't have one with me. So it was, yeah, it was just a nice splash in the water. It was good fun. Can I, can I just say, just because I've never been to this kind of place before, um, we had an outdoor hot tub. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Living the dream, so can, huh? It was living the dream. So we were in very toasty water with, you know, you could add a bit of jet <laughs> put the jets on and um under very the stars cool. <laughs> plastic plastic cups provided very sensible it was great it was so good, good. yeah oh, i'm glad yeah. you've had a nice weekend <laughs> oh right so listen let's jump in we've had some we've had some exciting super league action this weekend so let's jump in and talk about results sponsored by precisionhydration.com if you've not been on their website yet, get on there and take the online sweat test. That'll give you a good lead as to whether you're a particularly heavy or particularly salty sweater. 
If you are at the extreme end of that, you can even have an in-person sweat test done, which will tell you exactly how much volume you sweat in an hour, and it'll tell you how concentrated in terms of sodium your sweat is. For someone like me, who it turns out was at the very, very high end of sodiumness. So is that word health? Sodiumness? Sodiumness, absolutely. It is now. The higher end of sodiumness, it means that I can now take their really tailored, strong 1500 mil precision hydration uh, electrolyte salts. It's done away mostly with my cramp problems in the pool and also my problems with racing in the heat. So if you guys are having cramp problems or you're having problems feeling really ill after races, especially in the heat, it's most likely that electrolytes are the problem. Totally tasteless, which is really cool. You can add them to any drink. They don't taste salty, unlike the old generation of uh, electrolytes. So you can check it out over at precisionhydration.com. And remember, you can get a free box or tube of pH worth up to nine ninety nine using the code OxygenAddict. Right, Hells. Singapore looked like it was a bit tasty in terms of heat. They could have done with some pH over there this weekend, couldn't they? Well, it's it's kind of good prep, though, Rob, I think, for um for the Olympics and things like that, because it's clearly going to be very hot in Japan yeah. for next year. And there aren't that many races anymore on the ITU circuit, which are really, really warm. Yeah. So I think it, it will have actually been quite useful for the heat. But yeah, poof, it would. It's that kind of like sticky, humid heat, isn't it? Mm. I was most notable, I think, for uh, Johnny Brownlee sort of saying he'd, he'd had an awful year, but he was really taking confidence from the fact he felt he'd raced really well in the heat, which was mainly the reason he'd gone over there. So that's a real confidence booster for him, I think, going into an Olympics year where it's going to be hot and humid on race day there, because that's kind of been his Achilles heel in the past, I think, and clearly he thinks so. So it's good for him to get a confidence booster under the belt there, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Because, they, you know, you saw in um, Cosumel the other year when when he really, really struggled in the heat. And it's difficult when you do nearly all of your training in the UK. Yeah. You know, you specifically have to do heat adaptation work, don't you, to, yeah, to try totally. to adapt for the hotter climates. It's not like someone who, I don't know, lives and trains out in uh, let's say parts of the states which can get very humid and hot or or out in the middle east or even you know for let's say that the home athletes like the japanese athletes the singapore athletes they're going to be used to those conditions so yeah to have actually come out and raced well is a massive tick in that box yeah, Johnny said, it means a lot to come here and perform well in the heat. It's always been a weakness of mine, and I think I was one of the fittest athletes out there. If I'm honest, I've doubted myself this year, so this gives me a lot of confidence. So, yeah, good for him going forwards, I think, looking looking for the Olympic qualifications. Um, it'll be the test event, won't it? The next really big race for him, I suppose. Yeah, the, uh, the obviously the, uh, the ITU um, seasonal sort of be kicking in in uh, in Abu Dhabi, won't it? In a couple of weeks, yeah. um, and then that sort of circus gets rolling. But yeah, for the, the main things will be to get the qualification. Um, so with the test event, and then like as you say, also, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in a cyclist here, someone like Jason Kenny, right? Whenever whenever it was the Olympics, he's got an incredible knack of peaking and coming into form in an Olympic year. Yeah. And someone like, or like both brownies, I'd say, like Ali and Johnny, it's almost like they sort of rode this incredible wave season after season after season. Um, And then for Rio, yep, they were obviously both at their peak fitness. And then, you know, injuries are starting to kind of trickle in a little bit. And really... In the bigger bigger picture, it doesn't really matter about what happened last year, does it? Yeah, exactly. If you exactly. can get your place and then you can peak at the right time for Tokyo, then actually the you know the years in between. It's not quite. Yeah, so I think if you're if you're a selector, you're looking at the Brownleys and and you know that they are they are big occasion players. You know, here in football and rugby, the big game players turn up and they really want it when it's a big occasion. There's no yeah. doubt in their, their, their sort of mindset approaching these massive races. And I think it, it's easy on the one hand to go, you know, well, Johnny and Alistair, they're a little bit suspect when it's really hot and humid. Maybe we look at some of the other youngsters that are coming through who are unproven, but maybe don't have that problem in the heat. But the big thing with it being the Olympics, it's such a big high pressure situation I think the only little chink in their armour is performance in the heat. And that's such a small part compared to the 
the dealing with the massive pressure of the Olympics part of it. That's it. And they've been there twice. Well, um, you know, Ali's been there three and times. Three times, doesn't he? Yeah. Beijing as well. But they have been and they have performed twice. Yeah. Um, and no one's ever going to take that away. And that accounts for masses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I was really excited by the Super League stuff. The clips that I've seen, I didn't watch a lot of it live, but it was really exciting racing. We had, in the men's race, we had Van San Louis basically puncture at the first part of the first race. So he's out in the first eliminator, and you're thinking, oh dear, that's not that's not a great start, is it? No. Could be the most expensive puncture in history, but he sure battled back. Oh, it, it, he did, didn't he? Because that was sort of day one, and then day two, he sort of came back and came yeah. back in in an incredible form. Yeah, so really exciting racing again. I love the way the different um, the different races, the enduro on day two in particular, was was great in terms of it just being different. Really exciting, close racing, and uh, yeah, loved it. Thought it was great. I, I I think Rob that it is just a really really exciting format. Yeah. Something completely isn't different, isn't it? And it's yeah. I really think it has reinvigorated the sport. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think chapeau to um, Maka for for doing everything he did to to bring it. Yeah, you know, basically bring it to an international audience. And it, I reckon it it will make the World Triathlon Series like they'll have to raise the game, won't they? Exactly. In some way to make it more interesting and exciting, because exactly. otherwise the interest exactly. is going to go elsewhere. Yeah, and I think I, I do think that the mixed relay, which is going to be in the Olympics, for example, I do think that is going to be really yeah. exciting to watch. Um, and so that that's more from an Olympic point of view. Um, yeah, trying to continue to make it more appealing, and and that is the, you know, there'll be all the debates about sprint over Olympic and and things like that. That is the thing. If if an Olympic race it's pretty it can get really boring to watch can't it if, if nothing exciting is happening or if the course is you know really flat with there and if there are no breakaways even as yeah. triathlon fans if we're getting a little bit yeah okay it's over now yeah totally yeah yeah it's yeah. good all right so we'll just wrap up then the, the overall super league triathlon results um I, how would you pronounce this? Out? Cassandra Bogrand, is that correct, from France? Yep, très bien, très bien. Très bien. Yep. She takes the win in the Singapore race. Um, brilliant sprint finish between her and Katie Zafiris. Katie Zafiris had about a metre on her coming down the home straight. And then from nowhere, she just just zoomed up and kind of budged her <laughs> aside right on the line. It was great. Um, and it had to go right down to a photo finish, which they didn't give to Katie Zafiris. It went the other way. But Casey Zafiris does take the overall Super League Championship for 2018-2019. And that ties in nicely, Hells, with a little trail for today's interview of the week, doesn't it? It very much does, because we caught up with Katie Zafiris a couple of weeks ago, just before she headed out to Singapore. And so that is this week's interview of the week. Um, it was really, really good fun chatting to her. I caught her on um, on her rest day, I think, and she was about to go shopping to get everything ready for for basically leaving home and then being on the road for a good amount of time um but yeah really really fun interview a little bit about we kind of dig into more about her um yeah more about her the olympics super league that all that kind of stuff it's good good well, we'll look out for that a little bit later on in the show um the singapore results for the men johnny brownlee took the win and it, I've got to be honest, Alice, I really struggled to follow the maths that was going on to work out who was going to take the overall. <laughs> it was down between Van San Louis and Henry Schumann. And I think it came down to the person who finished in fourth or fifth place somehow as to which one of them actually took the overall win and ended oh, up wow. going to Van San Louis in the end. But I'm not clever enough to work out how the maths worked. I'm sure somebody somewhere was. Uh, if Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about the mathematical side of it, Rob. <laughs> There was a winner. It's all fine. It's all good. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what else I saw as well in terms of racing. There was, um, there's was been a race down in Australia, not a, an iron branded one, but a 70.3 called the Big Husky Triathlon Festival. Yep. Guess who took the win? You tell me. Craig Alexander. Oh, I thought he might have. I thought it was going to be. I thought it might have been him. But I didn't want to look silly, so I didn't say it. Craig Alexander takes the win in front of young Joe Skipper from last week's interview. So oh, really, that's that's shows what amazing shape he's in still, doesn't it? Yeah, 
I mean, wow. he's, I think he's 44 this year, Craig Alexander. So yep. he's gone 3.55 in the 70.3 distance. Um, he put two and a half minutes into Joe Skipper in the swim, rode another 30 seconds into him on the bike. So again, he's still in amazing bike shape. And then Joe ran 115.53 to take fourth overall. Oh, Craig God. Alexander still ran 116.37. So <gasps> Wow. Wow. A, he can still mix it with the very fastest athletes in the world, can't he? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Really, that that's good going, isn't it? It'd be great to see him rock up to the world 70.3 champs and just be, no pressure on me, guys. I'm just, just here to race and take scalps. <laughs> I, I, I don't think he'd take as many as you reckon he might. Well, it's hard to know, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't think he would take as many as you think because there are... You know, I've, let's just throw the um, throw them out there. Someone like Christian Blumenfeld could turn up. Probably will turn up. I um, love him. And I just don't think... <laughs> Any excuse to mention Christian. Well, I did think that when I was about <laughs> to mention it. I was just like, oh dear, Helen, get, get over this. Um, but he, he just wouldn't have quite the same speed as that now, would he? I'll tell you what he has got, though. He has got that wise old racing brain on his shoulders. Yes, true. And he is a real... We talked a little bit earlier, the big day performer... Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's lots of very fast performances throughout the year, but probably yeah. 60% of a pro field at the World Championships are going to beat themselves before they even race. So yeah. come on, Crowy, come out to Nice. <laughs> <laughs> very true. <laughs> uh, you're probably right. I don't know. Right. So that's uh, that's results over with for this week. And let's let's jump into a little bit of Coach's Couch this week, Hells. Haven't got... A question been sent in by a listener as such this week, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of, of hippy dippy talk this week because okay. I was out running this morning. Yep. We're having a bit of a bit of a sunshine and heat wave here in the UK at the moment, and the sun was rising as I was out for my run this morning. I was out before seven, and the sun came up at about about ten past twelve minutes past seven. Yep. And it struck me, I thought, there's nobody else out here. Why is no one else out here out for a jog or out for a bike ride and watching the sun come up? Because it's just brilliant. And the reason I'm saying it now is it's only going to be around at this sort of time when you can get out for a quick run before you leave for work for probably another two or three weeks. Yep. And then the sunrise is going to happen at half four, five o'clock in the morning, isn't it? Yep, yep. So it struck me that just a few weeks ago, we were moaning about how it's really dark. It's dark yes. after work. It's dark before work. Yeah, and it's dark when we get back from swimming. It's dark exactly. when I come out of the gym. But well, right now we're in the sweet spot of the sunrise happening as we're kind of at our, for most Normal people, time. Yeah, like half yeah. six as she's getting up for work time. If you yeah. can get your trainers on and get out for a run and get be out in this sort of half six to seven o'clock area. That's and I think amazing. the way that the sun sunrise time changes, it's about five or six minutes a day at this point. Yeah. And gradually gets more and more. So even in a week's time, it's going to be too early to get up and, or you're going to have to get really early to get out and have a run or a ride <laughs> at sunrise. So if you get the chance this week, especially over the next few days when it's going to be sunny and there's no clouds around, get out and have a run or a ride at sunrise and just see how amazing it feels being out there watching the sun come up. Because there's something very caveman about being out and seeing the sun come up that we just don't get to see in our everyday lives anymore because we live inside a brick house without windows pointing at the sun so that's my little <laughs> that's my little get out there in the sun call for this week <laughs> so it's funny you should say that actually because i was doing some uh, writing um recently um and i was talking a little bit about how um I'm doing a bit more running at the moment and like my yeah. run times are nowhere near where I could run sort of, I don't know, three or four years ago. Yeah. Um, and that's quite depressing. And if you think too much about it, you start sort of in a bit of a negative cycle and all that kind of stuff. And actually you have to focus on what you can do and what you can do at the moment with the body that you have. And I was saying, okay, I tried to focus on the fact that I can still run the interval times that I can do or the interval sessions, I can still do an interval session um, and you still get that same sort of hurt feeling, but the same feeling of satisfaction when you complete it. The times on a watch might be different, but still that satisfaction. 
Um, I also said about I still get a runner's high. Yeah, definitely. And then, and I, I said, I still get that absolute giddy feeling when I'm treated to a sunrise run. There you go. And it's not about having a GPS tracker watch on that's telling you how fast you're going. And it's not about running exactly nine minutes and walking for one. It's about being out in nature as much as you can and surrounding yourself with that and just... <laughs> Being grateful for it. Being grateful, being grateful for being... it. Exactly. It. It's less about it's performance exactly. and more about health, isn't it? Yep, totally. Yeah, so good for you. you. Awesome. Okay. Right, I've just got a couple of things to add in at the end of Coach's Couch there. There's two things you can do at the moment. If you're after some new tri kit or cycling kit, we've just opened up the Team Oxygen Addict kit shop. So there's a link in the show notes if you fancy a new skin suit for racing or a new cycle jersey or shorts or whatever. Fill your boots, get in there and get yourself one of those. And also, Hells, the Ironman Club rankings have been released. And we thought it would be fun. If people are out there and they haven't got a club that they're racing for, if you want to race for Team Oxygen Addict and represent us because you listen to the show, feel free. Get in there and register yourself. There's a link in the show notes. Get yourself in there for the, the Ironman Club rankings, which looks like a fun thing to do to try and all be part of a big team together. So if you're not part of a team, come and be part of our team. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing I would say about the um, it's race skin kit is that it's very comfortable. It is. It's lovely, isn't it? It's, it's a really high quality kit. Really good. Yeah. yeah. So again, links are in the show notes if you want to go and check over either Team Oxygen Addict kit or the Ironman Club rankings, and you're, you're short of some buddies to come and play with. Come and be part of our team. Um, right, Hells, tell us about our interview of the week. Uh, and before we do that, actually, let's give a shout out to our sponsors, foodcell.co.uk. If you're looking for something to carry around your gels or your flapjacks, or even Hells, you know what I discovered this week on the Turbo? It's ideal for putting the little remote control thing for your TV. If you're riding on the bike in front of the telly, the remote control thing just sits there perfectly. My phone sits in it perfectly as I'm listening to my tunes on the little headphones. It's a great solution, right? It's a very good solution given that, you know, sometimes you could go for the just resting on the towel option and then it just falls on the floor. It, well, we're making Fast a joke of this, but actually not having no, to, honestly, to put your phone is a right pain in the bum when you're on the turbo and you need Absolutely. the Foo Fighters blasting. Because you, right? you can't put it in your back pocket because it just gets sweaty. Exactamundo. So you might need somewhere to store your phone. More than likely, you'll definitely need somewhere to store your gels or flapjacks when you're training or racing this year. And foodcell.co.uk have got the solution for you. They've got a really nicely designed um, top tube nutritional carrier. It's made of plastic, so it's got a nice slidey top on. You can get the food into and out of easily. You can do it one-handed. The little sachet thing is waterproof, so anything you put in there is not going to get wet if it rains, which it probably will do at some point in the UK this year. <laughs> really, really good. You can get four of those big, fat, chunky gels in it, which is probably twice as much as anything else. And most importantly, you can operate that slider one-handed. So I've said before, I had a different brand of one on my race bike before, and it looked great, but I couldn't get anything into or out of it. This one looks great and has even been proven in the wind tunnel to improve the aerodynamics of some bikes, if that's the kind of thing that bothers you. But also, you can get into and out of it with one hand. So check it out at foodcell.co.uk. I think it's an awesome product. You can get free worldwide delivery using the code FREEPOST if you want to get yourself one. All right. Tell us about our interview, Hells. Yep. So she has just won the uh, Super League title uh, for the for this season, which is a pretty awesome She's uh, she's American. She's super, super talented. She's in Super League. She just dominates. It's amazing to watch her. She just missed out to Vicky Holland in the uh, World Triathlon Series. Overall, um, you know, winner for, for last season. And um, and she did compete at, at Rio, but we talk a little bit about that and the improvements that she's hoping to make for Tokyo. She's part of Joel Filial's um uh, JFT crew. I just had to think then about what the letters were. <laughs> and um, she was a real delight and really good fun to interview. So here is this week's interview of the week with Katie Zafiras. Katie Zafiras, hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast. Katie, I understand today is a Monday, which means that it's your rest day. 
Yes, it is so nice. <laughs> um, very chill day. We just have a swim and some strength. I love it. For for lots of people, a rest day would probably be a, a rest day, but for for professionals, for elites, there is often still like a very um, like a relaxed swim or or a relaxed sort of strength and conditioning session, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I would say I would say so. I mean, it, the strength doesn't always. Now I go to someone while I'm home for strength, and it's not always the easiest, but um, it's still it's still a rest day. So what does a rest day then, apart from the um, apart from the gym and apart from the swim, what does a rest day look like for Katie Zafiras? Um, well, it means that we're not really on a strict schedule because we don't have um, so much to do. So that's nice. Like this morning, it's just kind of chill. And when I feel like swimming, I'll go swim. And I mean, my time for strength I have, but uh, it's not till midday. And then Today, I, I want to go shopping um, just to get new clothes to take for the next. We're about to leave for camp in a week, and um, I want to go shopping to get new clothes for the probably almost 10-month period that we're gone again So <laughs> um, to refresh the wardrobe. And then also just because we're leaving, um, we're going to go and do a family thing with Tommy's family who also lives in the area because we're currently in Santa Cruz, California, which is kind of home. So, um, yeah, it'll be a nice day. And um, your wardrobe, um, (laughs) do you have to get things for, you know, summer and winter because obviously you're going to be on the road like literally for the next 10 months? Well, I realize I have a lot of like winter as as close to winter as we'll get for the next 10 months or what i hope <laughs> um we'll, we'll be as close to winter as we get i i don't need too too much but i was realizing i didn't have as many like short sleeve shirts or i don't know just more summery clothes which the first couple places i'll be will be pretty summery so <laughs> and do you actually get do you get much opportunity to wear non lycra um, no, and every year I need to, when I say I go shopping, it means I'll get like two things, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> because every year I like pack my bags and I realize, oh, I don't really wear this as much as I thought I would. Like I usually take a dress and, um, luckily with Super League, they have some nice functions. So we actually need to wear a dress, which is good. <laughs> so it gets used. But besides that, it's not really, yeah, I don't really wear that many things outside of and the things I want to get on my shopping spree are like sweatpants and a sweatshirt. So <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> it's really, um, yeah, not very high fashion. It's I a triathlete say. shopping spree. Yes. <laughs> Comfy <laughs> clothes to rest in that look like pajama or don't look like pajamas, but feel like them. Like you could, you could go out the house in them, but really they're like pajamas. Right, because here I wear like chill out penguin pajamas, so uh, a more well rounded sweatpants. Oh, right, shopping chat done. Love it. Um, <laughs> so, Katie, Super League, this is the next. Once we've got the shopping nailed, then Super League is, is the next thing on the, on the horizon. Um, has it been? Has it been difficult? training for it um back in california or or what's it been like kind of gearing up for that big first race of the season yeah it's been um it's been really good i train a lot with my husband tommy and um we have a pretty good setup here in santa cruz so we'll do a lot of the group rides which is good for me because they're so unpredictable and you're, I'm riding with strong riders, so it gives me that kind of race aspect. And um, training with Tommy is just like me trying to, because he's also training for Singapore. So on the bike is just a lot of me trying to hold on to him as he does his thing. Um, on the run, he really, he really helps me and does more of my running sessions. And then if he needs to, he'll have he'll add on at the end or kind of run in the second lane just to make it harder for him if we're on the track but it's it's been good the challenging part is it's not super hot here um but it's been good because we've been putting in joel my coach has been putting in a few things with heat adaptation within the last week or so so we've been doing a couple runs on the treadmill overdressed and um 
doing some sauna training. So it's kind of nice to play with those things and see if they work for Singapore. And then um, they'll also come in handy for Tokyo for when we get ready for that. What what do you enjoy the most about the Super League triathlon? I just enjoy how unpredictable it is, and I really think that it's um, you really have to be a strong all around athlete triathlete to do well in them. Because even though they're short races, there are also multiple races and multiple days. So you have to be good at being speedy, but then you also have to be able to back that up the next day and be able to recover well and last for the, the both days to do well in the end. So um, I think it's really challenging and it's also really focused on having every little thing done correctly. So it really makes you focus on the details and things. And is there anything that you don't like about it? Mm, no, I have... I like everything about it. I think, um, yeah, I just think it's an awesome different type of format for, it's so different from what we typically do, um, that it gets a little take, or it takes a little getting used to of it being also for like more entertainment purposes than, um, like when I go to world triathlon series, I am fully focused on myself and, not really doing much outside of getting ready to race. Whereas with Super League, you're doing a lot of like community functions and um, getting to know everyone, which is just more busy leading into the races. But it's so good in the sense that you feel really connected with where you're going and um, the other people who are from that country or also um, visiting to race or anything so it's it's really nice to have that like community engagement i guess and which format do you have a preferred format um out of all of like the eliminator or any of the other ones <sighs> well it's probably not the triple mix because that one just gets me confused <laughs> like it takes a lot of brain energy for me to like sit down and be like okay i'm not doing some like run for all three does someone, sh- does someone shout at you as to what like what you've got to do next you know if you're running no. into transition <laughs> no besides my besides tommy telling me and uh um when we were oh i'm having a brain fart when we were in jersey sorry um besides him telling me as i went to go on, get onto my bike for from the run to the bike that i still had my running shoes on <laughs> I do not have anybody, or we do not have anyone shouting at us, but I was lucky enough to have my husband there (laughs) paying attention to what I was doing because I obviously wasn't. um, But no, that one's, uh, yeah, that one's really challenging for me. But I think I, my favorite would probably be the Enduro just because it's just like, you just keep going and you're just done more quickly. (laughs) Whereas like sometimes the 10 minute breaks are hard because you really can't recover in 10 minutes. Um, for things like the Eliminator, but uh, you still have to go again. And how have you balanced training for that along with the season opener? Because it is it is different, isn't it? Super League and and you know your sort of standard Olympic distance. It is different, but it's also more similar than um, you would think for training wise. At least with Joel's program, we really don't have to do too much out of what we would do for an. A world triathlon series race or we haven't in the past and it's worked out really well um, I would say the main specific thing for Super League but it's really for Singapore is like for the heat training because of the location um, but also we do brick workouts so we'll do bike run workouts but we do that anyways. So even though that might seem like something that we're like focused purely on Super League for, really that's part of our normal program. So um, yeah, actually it works out really nicely that we don't have to change too much and we can be training for Super League and then two weeks later go to Abu Dhabi and feel prepared for that as well. 
have you missed the the squad that the crew because you're not with them at the moment and and i guess the rest of them are over in playitas are, are you missing the the gang i think i'm just about getting there like i really <laughs> love training with our squad but i see them more than anyone else during the year <laughs> so i really I, I just have really valued being home because we're home for two and a half months and we're with this squad for 10 months. So um, it's been it's been really nice being home. But at, at this time, like I'm also, yeah, once we start racing, I'm going to enjoy being with our teammate more, being with Joel more and um, just having that to the support and the amount of different people to train with. It's just it's a lot more fun. And it's nice to be connected with all our teammates. Did did you think that you would like, you know, that squad environment as much as you do? Oh, yeah. One of the things, like, that when I was looking for a team or looking for a new coach, it was looking for a squad that would elevate my level. And um, when I first started with Joel, it was after – the Edmonton grand final, I think it was, I think that was 2013 and his squad had like three in the top 10 and I was ninth. And I was like, Oh, well, if I was, if I, if he had four in the top 10, it would be almost like it was more than 25%. So of like his squad. And I mean, even with Australia last year, we had their six podium spots at the grand final and he had four out of six of them. So I always, I just think that's really cool. And it's a really, it's, it just makes me better as an athlete. And I like being around such high quality athletes, but also just people like everyone on this team is amazing. So um, it's, yeah, it's just, I've enjoyed it just as, as much, if not more than what I thought I would. Did it take much persuasion to for sort of for you to get into the squad in the first place it did take a bit um well it felt like a bit maybe it wasn't so long but it felt (laughs) like a long time um tommy was in the squad so that's kind of why i was pretty lucky um because at the time sarah true was on the squad so joel wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do if he wanted to have more than one american on the team and Ultimately, he decided that he did, and I'm so thankful because it's been. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Like I don't, I don't know what my backup plan would be. <laughs> what What's the sort of like the the competition like between you know between you and and the other athletes? Because you all have similar goals, whether that be, you know, World Triathlon Series, getting to the Olympics, or even then competing against each other at the Olympics yeah I think it's I wouldn't say it's that competitive like we bring out each other's best in the workouts for sure and we push each other but like it never feels in an like it's in a native way or I don't ever feel like I'm in training like racing my teammates in in a way that's detrimental I guess it's um, it's cool to hold each other to high standards and be pushed by one another, but without feeling um, like any, I don't know, I don't want to use the word aggression, but like with any, without any negative vibes. So um, I think that's good. And then also like Joel is really good about individualizing plans. So for me, I do, I would say I do less than most of the people in our group. And I also have more like what we call Katie days which means what's like what's a katie day <laughs> it, it's nice it, it means i do less <laughs> and usually um i'll do something more like individual so i do like a lot of my easier things just alone and it's not because i don't enjoy training with the group it's just because i like to go as slow as i want to or like not worry about the different paces of different people or sometimes i just like putting in my headphones and going for a run so uh, it's been important to kind of balance both of those things. And has that taken a little bit of time to uh, to for, for Joel to sort of almost not necessarily trust you, but for Joel to accept right, 
okay, Katie needs these odd different days, Katie needs a Katie day, I'm going to put it in there. Like I imagine at the beginning, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have had a Katie day. Right. It's definitely evolved over the past few years and it's been really cool for like Joel and my relationship because I think it's just gotten better and better and our communication has gotten a lot better. And for him, he, he can tell mainly by my like mental energy and my mood, like, okay, this is like, we've been more proactive about it rather than reactive of like, oh, you really need a day. <laughs> like now they're kind of scheduled in intermittently so that I never feel like it's like, oh, I need this now, but I've already had it so I can kind of maintain where I'm at and still be in good, good spunkiness. I like the word. That's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good choice of words. Good, good spunkiness. So uh, like a, a rest day isn't a Katie day then? No, like some day, like last Monday he put in like for the swim for my Monday swim, which usually has more structure, but it, it was a harder weekend for me. And he put in like Katie special for the swim and it just says choice duration and choice set. So I just pick what I want to do. Um, when we're on this, when we're with the squad, I don't, I, I usually have one swim a week. That's kind of my choice. Um, he'll set like how much he wants me to do, but I can just, I just go in another lane or in the back of the lane and, just kind of do my do my own thing which I always kind of feel bad about for everyone else who's swimming and doing like a hard workout but it's working for me so stick with it <laughs> stick yeah. with it go with what works and and you mentioned there about you know if you want to do an easy run or or an easy ride um as age groupers I think a lot of us are not very good at going easy when it says easy so what sort of pace are your easy runs Oh, uh, it's dependent a lot on how I feel. So my easy runs can be anywhere from like, it's like 515 pace, I would say, to they can actually be kind of fast if I'm feeling good and I'm by myself. Like, I'll kind of just go with how I feel. But for the most part, I think what I enjoy most about kind of going out and running by myself like easy is that sometimes it just feels better if you're not talk like if you're definitely going your own pace and not having a conversation or anything you're like wow like I'm running like this feels really easy but I'm actually running okay or um, or at least that happens for me maybe no one else but um, <laughs> it's it's being able to kind of zone out to take whatever turn I want without having to communicate to someone else where I want to go or change my mind during it or finish with like a 10 minute walk if I want to like stuff like that that's amazing uh, honestly you saying that you finish with like a 10 minute walk um yeah that is something that we can all uh take a take a little bit from that's ace um Katie what about um when um I my honestly I had a, I I have completely lost my mind on this one I was about okay. to pick up on something that you said. This is, do you? Do you have a moment where you're just like, oh, it's gone. I don't know what I was going to say. Oh, yes. Very often. You can ask Tommy about that. <laughs> do you I'm start... not the best filling in details. <laughs> do, you, do you start a sentence and get halfway through and then trail off and go, what was I even saying? I don't even know what I was saying. Yeah, or I do the thing with Tommy where I'm like, did I say this out loud to you or just in my head? <laughs> Yeah, I do that too. <laughs> anyway, just in your... Okay, well, let me tell you what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember what my question was going to be or what I was going to pick up on, but um, I do want to know, <laughs> tell me about the uh, a cork. Do you take a cork with you everywhere? I do. I actually take two now. But... Okay, fill me in. What's this about? So the first cork was from one of the coaches with USA Triathlon. It was at... It wasn't my first World Cup, but it was the first, it was at New Plymouth, which doesn't even exist anymore, but it was a really nice race. Um, that's in New Plymouth, or, wait, sorry, not New Plymouth, that's wrong, Palamos, <laughs> which is in Spain, it was in Palamos, and um, my, the coach and USA Triathlon support 
he found a cork that morning and said he thought it was good luck, so he gave it to me, and then that was the first World Cup I won. So, um, so since then, I've carried a, a cork from Spain with me, um, yeah, to every race. And then when I made the Olympics, we had a party with some friends here, and they popped a cork to celebrate, and I took that one too. <laughs> Will there be a third cork? I sure hope so. It's good for me that they're not very heavy. Although sometimes I think, like, I guess that's not... I don't know if it's a superstition, but I just kind of like the... I like to think about it. <laughs> and where do you keep it? When So when it comes... Have you, you know, when you're packing your bag for Singapore, where does the court go? Uh, they just go... Like, it's in my backpack, just in, like, a little pocket. It, it's not in a shrine or anything. It's... <laughs> just floating around like trash but it to me it means it means more than that <laughs> and is it in your bag on a race day yep yeah i just usually keep it in my transition bag which is also like the backpack that i travel with there you go so uh tokyo 2020 clearly a massive goal um what would it mean to you to um to get on the podium at the olympics uh, I mean, I think it'd be, it, it'd be amazing. I think for me, like, um, I want to, I definitely want to be on the podium, but I also want to take everything that I learned from competing in Rio and do Tokyo 2020 better. <laughs> uh, because when I look at my experience, how I race, then physical, mental, everything from Rio, I was kind of disappointed with myself. So what I really want to do or what one of my biggest goals is just go into Tokyo as a Katie 2.0 version kind of and just do it better, like enjoy the experience more, take in more of the actual Olympics, like know, um, be more confident in what I'm going to do and focus more on what I've done for those races that have gotten me there, hopefully get me there. Um, more so with like the process and things like that, because that's what I've probably learned the most is that once I start focusing too much on the race or like the outcome, I get away from the kind of not ease of racing, but like it's simple enough to break it down and be like, okay, and triathlon, like, I want to go out fast to the first buoy. I want to be first in the transition. I want to have good positioning on the bike. Like those are the things that get me where I want. So that's what I want to do to first qualify for Tokyo and then hopefully do really well there. Did you feel a bit overwhelmed by the whole experience in Rio? I think I felt that in Rio I should focus on, like solely on the race, which which I, in, in ways I think is correct. And because we were the like second to last day of the Olympic schedule, I was really focused on my race. And then when I was disappointed in my race, the Olympics was over. <laughs> and so I feel like I didn't take in how cool it was to actually be there. And one of, and I became a lot more like a job going, both going into the Olympics and at the Olympics which is not what I want, I guess. I've found that when I take the time to enjoy that process and enjoy that, wow, this life is really cool. I get to go really neat places, do this all with my husband and with teammates and a coach and family and bring them all along. Like that's when I do the best is when I, I'm like, wow, like Hamburg's a really cool place to be. Like, let me ride my bike and see if I can find something cool. Like, or walk into... I don't know, I've done some, like, a walking tour somewhere, or in Montreal, we've gone to um, a really beautiful church, and so, like, having different experiences in different places, to me, makes racing and competing kind of more fulfilling, which, therefore, makes me race better. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And it's, it is the Olympics, and they are just incredible experiences, and you sort of think, they might be, okay, once in a lifetime, it might be twice, it might be three times, it might be an incredible four times, you know, but they are yeah. something very, very special, which not everyone gets to experience. 
Yeah, and it's just, I mean, it. I think for a lot of people, it's a hard balance between the expectations of the Olympics and also, um, like, obviously performing on a day and things like that. So I am always so thankful for having the first Olympic experience because... I really hope to have another one where I can take everything that I learned because I also know that that experience is what shaped me these last two years or has made me even more um, motivated and uh, ready to try and be the best version I can in 2020. I'm not going to ask a really cool question about what would you want more, you know, Olympic podium or world triathlon, um, world champion. I'm not going to ask that one. I'm going to ask instead a question. Why, why choose? Why choose? Yeah, no, nah, not going to. Exactly, exactly. Go for it all. Uh, right, Ziggy says, if you weren't a triathlete, what would you be? Well, I, I'm supposed to be a teacher <laughs> based <laughs> off my degree. Uh, for physical education but I think if I weren't a triathlete I'd want to I'd want to do something in like health and wellness um, with just going to families more women I don't know why but um, just helping them with like going to a grocery store and showing how like you can shop the store and make good like healthy choices for eating dinner and trying to find like which physical activities are the ones for them. So um, women who, I guess I'm inspired by my mom who dedicated so much life, so much of her life to her kids' life, like me and my sisters. And so I kind of want to give back to those moms who don't have time and maybe need some help with the health and wellness aspect. And do you think you might go into that after your triathlon career, whenever that might be? I'd like to. I have a lot of little clouds and spindles going out of my brain for what I want to do next, and it's always changing. So don't hold me to that. But it is <laughs> one thing that's interested me for more than like a year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Steve Addison says, How do you find the motivation to pick yourself up and go again after crashes? You know what's funny? I find it very easy. <laughs> well, really? have a concussion but um I find when something wrong happens in a race that it's just really clear to me what the next step is and so like when people talk about the flow state I most often get in the flow state after something not ideal is going on because to me it's so clear that what I need to do is catch up that everything else turn kind of like turns off and I like I feel capable in general. I like chasing. Um, I prefer not to do it after crashing, but I feel capable of chasing people down. So um, if it happens on the bike, I feel like I can do it. Now I've had two bike crashes where this kind of ended my race being well, more than two actually, but the last one being Abu Dhabi where I just, (laughs) I didn't get up and, um, and I kind of came to in the ambulance. And then after everybody was telling me, that I was asking them if I won, <laughs> um, which I thought was a joke at first. Like I thought, like, oh yeah, I, I was definitely kidding then. Until I heard, like multiple people told me I asked them. I was like, ooh, maybe I was not kidding. Really? So, um, so yeah, um, I I think my brain just goes into maybe that type of autopilot where it's like, that's all I want to do then. <laughs> It's just, you want to win, doesn't matter, I'm going to crack on and get back on and go again. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's nice. Um, You're an ice cream lover, favourite flavour, please? Chocolate chip cookie dough, but with the big chunks of cookie dough. Like, I don't like when you get chocolate chip cookie dough and there's like nothing, it's like speckles. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's a poor return. <laughs> yeah, it's not that's a cookie dough. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a cheap cookie dough. Um. And then, Katie, I know lots of people have, and you've spoken lots about it, clearly, because um, you were on a TV show about it. But the small house, okay, we're we're coming on to the small house. But what I want to know, or what I should explain, is that basically uh, you and Tommy were part of a TV program um, 
to live in tiny house so tiny house nation um to go and live and you still have this tiny house which is eight foot by 28 feet uh normal mobile home is like 15 by 72 so it is small but things about right as triathletes we have so much junk so has it taught you to be more minimalist and is there anything that you got rid of that you wish you hadn't got rid of so i don't know if this is considered cheating but full honesty is we do have a shed <laughs> so for a lot of tra- like our gear we do we keep it in the shed more so than the actual house um but like for clothing and things like that we just like i just have one of those cube organizers where you have like the fabric drawers i don't know if you know what i'm talking about but, yeah i know um, yeah like I have like six of those and Tommy has three <laughs> because Tommy's really good at being a minimalist and I'm kind of good at it sometimes. Uh, but it does, it really makes me think about like what I necessarily need or don't need. And like, I have this tendency, it's kind of weird. I don't know, maybe more people do it, but like, I really like online shopping, but not buying anything. Like I just fill carts and then I'm like, ah, I don't need it. I don't need that. But it's probably because of not having really a place to put it or being home to use it that I kind of feel that way. And how many bikes did you have before you moved into the tiny house? And how many bikes do you still have? So we have, I think we have, we probably still, we actually we have more bikes now than when we moved in the tiny house but they're more spread out because (laughs) we have one of one of Tommy's bikes stays in Maryland so that when we go back to my family um, and visit them that we have a bike to ride along with my brother-in-law he has one of our bikes as well because I said we're not going to use it so like he he just holds on to it for us and uses it when he wants to Uh, and then we have four bikes I think hanging in the back of our tiny house that we just kind of keep there for storage and then we keep our two bikes that we use um, in the shed and pull them in and out when we're using them. And is there anything that you got rid of that you wish you hadn't? Not really, no. I think um, I've been I've been really wanting this husband pillow that I had, but that's actually from when I was in college and it's at my house in Maryland. So it's still there, but just not with me. <laughs> Love it. One one final question, Katie. What do you think it will um, take to get on the top step of the WTS podium this year? Well, smarter, faster, stronger would be my really not specific answer but I think um I really think it's just going to take more of me just focusing on the smaller the smaller details of things and learning um more about the sport I think what I find most exciting about my career and what motivates me the most is that I've never felt like I've maxed out on my abilities or um feel like I have to do anything too extreme to get to the next step. I just like consistently with Joel is building the foundation. So every year I feel um, like I have a bit more of a handle on the sport. But one of the things that I've continued to want to evolve is like feeling the confidence on the bike and obviously um, feeling more confident on the run. I really like to chase, but I don't always like to lead. So that was a big thing for me in Gold Coast is that I actually took the risk to lead. And even though it didn't work out, it was really an empowering feeling where I felt like I crossed this threshold. It was like, oh, wow, like I can race in a more aggressive way or more assertive way. So I think just feeling more, more of that and just continuing to yeah, put in the work and keep developing is going to hopefully get me there. I cannot wait to watch you this season. It's going to be really, really cool. Um, Katie, have a great shop. Happy shopping and safe travels <laughs> to um, Singapore. Thank you. It's so nice talking to you. 
All right, great interview there with Katie Zafiras. And we just got time to jump into our new section before we close up for the week this week. Right, so before we go into the news, and I've got some good stuff to tell this week, Hells. Shout out to sponsors Thriver.co. Now, we mentioned them first time on last week's show. Thriver.co are an online blood testing service. So there's two great ways this can work for you. The first one is if you want to have like a health checkup and check all the levels of different things in your blood or where they should be, things like cholesterol and vitamin levels. It's a bit of a pain to go to the doctors and have to get sent down to your local hospital to the blood unit to have it tested. It takes half your day up. This little packet arrives through the post. You do a little stamp thing on your little finger. Four drops of blood goes into a little test tube. You label it. You pop it back in the post. It took me literally five minutes from the box coming through the door, me opening it, including time to read the instructions. And I'm not the brightest bear in the forest, am I, Hells? So if I can get it done in five <laughs> minutes... on yourself. <laughs> if I can get it done in five minutes, anybody can. A few drops of blood. In it goes, into the envelope, off to post. Results were back with me like a day later online. I've got a little email that says, here you go, Rob, here's your results. And they've gone through all of the things that have tested with me. You've got like a nice, easy to understand for not bright bears like me, like a sliding scale that goes green, orange, red, and it tells you where you're on the line. So for me, most of my stuff was good hells. Never had a cholesterol test at my age. I probably should have done, but came out all right. Yeah, there you go. Really little, good to know. little thing written up by a GP to say, this is great. Here's your lipid profile. It's all good and balanced and you've got nothing to worry about. Plenty of that good cholesterol, nothing to worry about. The thing that was key for me was it flagged up that my vitamin D and my vitamin B12 were low. Um, and one of the things it says in my vitamin D that I hadn't read before, that I read just before the show, Hells, is it says, if you are feeling, yeah, suffering from low mood, fatigue and tiredness, Vitamin D might be the problem. And there's me thinking, wow, I've been a bit down recently. I've been really sleepy in the afternoons. I wonder if that might be it. So for mm. me, it's been a dead easy solution to just buy some, you know, those little um, online supplements for vitamin D and B12, yep. boost the levels up, have another test done again in a month's time and, and see where we are. That, yeah. That's, and are you feeling a little tiny bit, a little bit better? I definitely am. I'm not going to say it's definitely because I'm taking supplements because I've just been for four days in Mallorca in the sun. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that, Vitamin D. There you go. That's something to do with it. <laughs> but it's really made me wonder whether that's something that I need to take care of in the winters in future, because I have been the kind of person who suffers terribly with low mood, especially during the winter. Mm. Um, and I wonder whether it's a, something as simple as, I mean, we're always looking for a simple yeah. solution, aren't we? But yeah. It's, yeah, it's great to have someone have a pointer and go, you know, here's some information that might help you feel better about stuff. So totally. Yeah. Totally. So anyway, there's a link in the show notes. If you click on that, it'll take you to their website. It's thriver.co. And if you use the code oxygen addict, you get 50% off um, the baseline or advanced test, which is just great. And then you can have all kinds of extra tests done the next time. They even do testosterone level testing, which I think would be really interesting for a lot oh, of, yeah. a lot of aging male age groupers. Um, it's funny, it's something I was talking about with my dad, who he's 70, 76 this year, I think. Yeah. And he's really struggling with feeling really exhausted all the time. And I'm going to encourage him to have one of these done because it might be something that a little supplementation for a guy his age allows him to go out and ride again. Yeah, whereas yeah. at the moment he's too tired three days of the week to do it, sadly. Mm. Yeah. All right. So a bit of news then. It's all about Iron Man UK this week, Hells. <laughs> Well, we spoke about it last week, didn't we? We did a little bit, and it's been confirmed. So yes, several of my friends. Yeah, the new bike course has been confirmed. There's going to be over, it says on the website, officially 2,400 metres of climbing. A friend of mine went out and rode one of the loops and recorded 1,300 metres this weekend. Oof. And it's two loops, right? It's two loops of that, plus the, the outward leg is all uphill as well, isn't it? So... Somewhere between two four two six, which puts it north of Ironman Lanzarote in terms of elevation gain, and it's basically if you do an Ironman UK this year, get some hard training done on the bike because there's no free speed. I'm afraid it's a proper hard woman's hard man's course, rough road surfaces, no free speed, yeah. lots of slow corners. You've got to be a good bike handler. It's a proper cyclist's route. 
But what they're trying to do is take it to a few new places, aren't they? A few new sort of areas. Yeah. Take it to a few new areas and also still really have that kind of really good um, race vibe, supporters vibe, um, like in, in Bolton as well on, on the run. Obviously, we're talking about the bike course, not the run course. Yeah. So the well, that's an interesting point because the the bike course is going to come through the town centre of Bolton and it's going to go into the town centre and do that loop on the cobbles. So the race director has said, you know, it's our kind of like homage to Paris Roubaix. I'm not sure <laughs> how many. People. Yeah, I'm not sure how many people are going to be thanking oh. him for riding over the cobbles and three times in an Ironman bike leg. Well, but it's you know, definitely going uh, to earn its <sighs> toughest bike course branding because th- they want it to be tougher than. Like it's going to be tougher than Wales, isn't it? Or is well, it on a yeah. car? Well, I. Who knows? There mm. certainly is much climbing on it, and having cobbles three times in an Ironman bike leg is my idea of utter misery. Well, and I just go back to the seventy point three in um, yeah in Mexico, and it had rained, and they were slippy, and it was horrendous, and that was only seventy point three. Yeah, yeah, it was like trying to pedal on. Never rains nice. in Bolton, no hell, so it'll be fine. It'll be no, fine. Exactly. It's always it's always sunny. It'll be <laughs> absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, never rains in Bolton. I do plan to be there, Rob. To you know, me too. Plan to be there. We can go down, Hells. We can set up a little. Uh, let's take backpacks and collect all the water bottles that get ejected from people's behind the seat oh, bottle carriers. Honestly, we can have a little like... shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be. It will be. I mean, I, I when I did Ironman UK, I genuinely, genuinely loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, so, great event, and I think the fact really that the bike good. ride is going to go through the town centre is going to be really awesome in terms of support. So that's the yeah. positive side of it, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, so. other news to come out is that there's not going to be a pro race at Ironman UK this year, so no pros yeah. at all. That's I think that's such a shame, isn't it? But they're yeah. going to make um, so the new Ironman Cork, so the new Ironman in Ireland, which sold out pretty quickly. That's going to be a pro race, isn't it? Right didn't know that actually that's good to know yeah and um dunleary uh, sorry dunleary weymouth i mean will still be 70.3 weymouth that'll still be yeah. pro yeah um so, shame so, to have yeah. no pros at ironman uk though at the what's essentially like the first official ironman in the country it's a shame uh, that yeah, they don't agree. get pro slots i think uh, i really really agree um it's, it's like exmoor isn't it when they stopped when that stopped being a pro race yeah and then, well, I think it's something we're probably going to see more of around the world as well as they've moved yeah, to the massively. the different pro qualification structure. You're probably going to see more races that are not pro races. Um, it's been quite common in America for several years where one race has had. In fact, they did it in Denmark and Sweden, didn't they? Okay. One year with yeah. the men Copenhagen, race. Copenhagen, Kalmar, they still do that. Yeah, That's they right, sort of yeah. alternate them. Yep. Yeah. I think it's. Well, at the end of the day, it's a it's a business, isn't it? And that's what it comes down to. It comes down to money, and uh, you know all the age groupers and all that. It does mean we're going to get to see an age group an age group champion at UK though overall? So yes, true. There's going to be some very hot age groupers racing for that. I wonder which one of the which ones of the big British age groupers are going to target the sights on that? Because that'd be a massive race win, wouldn't it? A race that mm. big, not yeah. racing pro. Yeah. 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 Mm. good stuff a few, few ideas in my head right not well i think not. we'd better wrap the show up hadn't we hells we are yes, let's we do are that. babbling on so um listen everyone thanks again very much for listening uh shout out to our sponsors again one final time precisionhydration.com foodcell.co.uk and thriver.co remember there's links in the show notes to all the different things we've talked about if you want to go and check them out so until next week You've been listening to the Auction Edit Triathlon Podcast. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And have a great safe training and racing week. And please get out for a ride or a run this week at sunrise. Maybe even send us a photo on Twitter if you get out there and do it. It's brilliant. All right, everyone. Take it easy and we'll see you again next week. See ya. See ya.